Warping. So pros of warping, um, everything's gridded to your global BPM. If all your material is warped, you can do some pretty crazy stuff with the full expectation that it will always stay in time. Um, there's a lot of different types of effects, for example, that you can only use with warped material. Um, so really, you can only use with uh, Ableton or, I guess, potentially Tractor, which does have its own warping built in, um, or Serato or something. But um, lots of kind of things like having delays that are actually properly synced to the tracks you're playing or um, beat repeat or buffer effects that actually uh, line up perfectly with what you're playing. Um, the downside of warping, or I guess just one of the limitations of Ableton, is you can't have unwarped audio in Ableton and expect to be able to get it in time. Um, I tell you now that trying to warp things live on stage is a harrowing experience and you shouldn't try. I've done that, it was awful. Um, and Ableton doesn't really give you any tools for manually beat matching things if you haven't gone in and warped them. You can't just kind of you know do, do the vinyl backup option. So I guess the, the downside of, of the system is that you basically 100% have to have everything warped unless it's a cymbal crash or something that isn't actually rhythmic sound. So um, warp modes, someone asked about that. Um, that's, that's a very important thing. And this is another one of those uh, gotchas that people often have issues with um, when, when coming into Ableton. So basically, um, by, I forget which, I think Ableton uses beats mode by default. I don't know, I keep changing it. But um, basically, the, 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 the simplest uh, warp mode you can have is what's called uh, repitch warp mode, which is basically what uh, a turntable will do which essentially means when it speeds up the audio, to speed up the audio, it plays it faster, which means it plays it in a higher pitch. And to slow down the audio, it plays it in a lower pitch. So if I play this track, it gets silly. So you can hear that the, um, the pitch changes. Now that is uh, the default behavior in any kind of analog equipment. And that's the only behavior that you'll have in Ableton that doesn't have any um, quality loss, I guess, associated with it. Um, it's, it's just pitching it up and down, it's just speeding it up or slowing it down. It's not actually um, doing any maths in it other than that. Um, most of the time, this is actually the warp mode I use, especially because a lot of the music I play is kind of techno-y and amelodic, so what key it's in is not really a concern for me. Um, but sometimes, uh, particularly when I'm working with vocal material, if you the uh, human brain is very wired to subtle changes in vocals, so pitching this track up a little bit is a pretty subtle difference. If that was a vocal sample, you'd really notice it. Uh, it's, you, your brain just picks up on that. So one of the, the common examples is um, when you're DJing tracks that have prominent vocal samples and you're playing them faster or slower and you don't want them to sound like hip-hop or a chipmunk. Um, so to achieve that, you've got a whole bunch of different what are called warp modes in Ableton. And these are essentially different algorithms that Ableton can use to attempt to um, either speed up or slow down the audio without changing the pitch. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not going to try and get into the maths of this, but this, this is inherently a, a lossy, a, um, an imperfect process. Particularly when you slow down a track, um, you're actually creating more time, but you're not creating more information to fill that time with. So you've actually got to make up information to, to put in there um, when you're slowing down a track but trying to keep it at the same pitch. And when you're um, speeding a track up, you're actually losing space for information, so you're essentially having to try and drop information that is not particularly important out um, so that you can speed things up more and more without changing the pitch. Um, some very smart people who are much better programmers than I and worked on these warp modes, so I can't tell you a damn thing about how they work under the hood but I can tell you about the, um, the practical manifestations. So the, the first, and I guess the most um, easy to understand warp mode is beats mode. And this is, this is a warp mode that was really originally designed for drum loops and things like this. So if, if you imagine a, a drum loop pattern, I may have one, give me a second. Um, no, I don't think I've got any. Um, drum loops and things like that on this computer. Sorry about that, it's not my production machine, it's just my traveling one. Um, so I have to explain with the intro of this track because it's relatively clear. So if you look at like, um, for example, here, 
we take a uh, this pattern here and we play it. That's basically a drum loop. It's the introduction to a track, right? Um, and one of the things you'll notice about the way this drum loop works is you've got these these things that you'd call hits in the, the terminology of kind of beat slicing. Um, hits, which are discrete drum sounds um, that are often have empty space or almost have empty space between them. So you can see you've got the kick, kick, hat, snare, hat, kick, hat, snare, hat. It's a very basic breaks pattern. And you'll notice that there are kind of discrete gaps between each of these hits. So what you can do is slice these each individual hit up into a discrete sample, and then you can treat them just as samples. So this, this was very common when hip hop um, musicians used to play on MPCs and stuff. They'd slice up drum loops, they'd spread out all the drum sounds over the MPC, and then they could play it at any speed they like. And Beats Mode in Ableton basically does this. It's a, um, a warping mode that's optimized for dealing with uh, samples that are rhythmic and probably um, they're probably drum beats or similar percussive sounds or spaces. So it just um, slices them up, and when you slow things down, it um, basically just puts gaps in between them. Um, there's a bit more finesse in there, but this is kind of at core what it does. And when you speed them up, it just kind of plays them faster and overlaps them a bit. So this this is fantastic for audio like this. Um, you can speed that up a fair bit. Uh, that's not on beach mode, my apologies. And it does a little bit of kind of crossfading, finessing and stuff like that, but it's it's great for that. On the other hand, it's really, really, really awful for entire tracks. It's really awful for tonal things like singing or instruments and stuff like that. Um, it will tend to kind of snarl and stutter um, when you slow down, especially on tonal sounds. So beats mode is really exactly what it says on the tin. You use it for beats and not much else. Um, you certainly don't use it for entire tracks unless they're like minimal techno tracks or something like that that are actually just percussion um, and beeps. It works on beeps. Um, the next one you've got is tones. Um, I can't tell you much about the distinction between tones and texture. Um, they sound substantially, well, they sound different. I tend to use them on the same sorts of sounds and I just uh, switch back and forth between the two of them until I decide which one sounds best. Um, but basically tones and texture are both uh, warp modes that are designed for uh, sounds that are continuous. So they, they work relatively well on vocal sounds, they work relatively well on pads and I guess violin sounds and things like that. Um, they tend to stretch things out in a way that, that keeps the character of that sound. But if we apply tones, for example, you can hear it kind of starts to sound very stretched and gritty. And similarly with uh, texture mode. Whereas if we put that in beats mode, it's quite a lot snappier and punchier. Um, again, tones and texture, those are useful if you're, you're working with your own material and you're trying to warp um, our vocal samples or things like that. And the, the usual rule of thumb there is just to uh, go through them until you find the one that sounds the least bad. Um, but you wouldn't really use them for whole tracks or uh, things like that. Repitch, we've discussed. Complex and Complex Pro. Um, since Ableton put Complex Pro in in Live 8, Complex is completely pointless, as far as I can understand it. Um, and I never really use it. It's a little bit more CPU efficient. But basically, Complex and Pong Complex Pro are... Uh, warp modes that try and take the best of all worlds. Um, they're much more computationally intensive, like your CPU load will go up a lot more if you're using Complex, but, um, or Complex Pro. But um, it tries to give a, an accurate average of all the different warp modes you've seen here. So if you are warping an entire track and you're, you're seriously expecting to um, adjust the BPM, uh, Complex Pro is probably the one you want to use as it has the most kind of well-rounded in general. Um, response. So you can hear, you know, if we go into the middle of this. It doesn't sound great, but it, it has kind of the least downsides. And obviously I'm deliberately using BPM shifts that are extreme. Um, for the most part, I would only, I would only actually adjust a track by four or five BPM at the outside, and um, one or two ideally. So unless you're trying to do quite 
interesting and odd performance things with radically different BPMs, in which case I'd encourage you to experiment with the warp modes and actually try and come up with some creative applications of the way in which they sound awful. Um, it's it's just generally something to be avoided to to make those big BPM changes. And 90% of the time these days, I use repitch and I actually go into Ableton and um, I've changed the default to repitch um, for production reasons. Otherwise, I accidentally warp stuff without realizing it and then I render the warp stuff and it sounds awful and I don't know why, which gets confusing. If we go into beats mode, the beat, uh, it, it has options for what you preserve. Um, by default, it's a transient, so it tries to preserve all the uh, transients that's detected here. But you can also just to tell it to uh, preserve it in sections 1 32nd note, 1 16th note, 1 8th note, or whatever, just to uh, force it to do a regular pattern. And then down here, you've got um, three different options for how it tries to interpolate when you're slowed down. Um, that basically means it will play the sample through and then stop once. Um, this means it will loop the sample. Uh, we will just go to the end and then start again. And this means it will, it will um, I think they call it uh, crossfading the sample, but we will play to the end of the sample and then it will play backwards back to the start of the sample. So it will go like that. Um, so if we slow this down a lot, you'll be able to hear the difference. Is that loud enough for you guys to hear clearly? Lovely. So you can hear this mode is a little bit punchier and snappier, less faded. That one's kind of stuttery, and that one's kind of odd. <laughs> so these are subtle differences, but there are, there are some cool creative applications. I use beat mode a lot instead of um, gating to do stutters and things like that because it's, it's a bit more controllable.